Special thanks to our promotional partners at the American Philatelic Society. The APS is the largest stamp collecting organization in the world, supporting collectors of any level worldwide. For more information about membership and APS services, visit stamps.org. I'm Charles Epting from Nature Harmer in New York City. And I'm Michael Cortese of Noble Spirit in Pittsfield, New Hampshire. And this is Conversations with Philatelists. So, Charles, today our guest is probably one of, if not the most well-respected Civil War uh, philately dealer in in the United States, po- possibly even the world. I would imagine that most Civil War right? uh, <laughs> dealers are located in the United States. I would be shocked if there was a more prominent uh, Confederate stamp dealer uh, outside of the U.S. So by saying that she's US the most Civil prominent, War, yeah. yes, by saying she's the most prominent in the U.S., that gets you uh, yeah. the rest of the world. Why don't you tell us? It's like the World the- Series of Baseball. <laughs> Who's our guest today, Michael? Uh, Trish Kaufman, we're talking to, and I am uh, beyond excited about this. She's just got a. You told me you've never actually met Trish before. No, we've only ever exchanged hundreds, thirty emails. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Then I'm really excited for you to to meet her virtually because Trish is awesome. Uh, Trish is. um, I don't when it's not like I'm saying this about every guest. Mm-hmm. Um, but Trish genuinely is one of those people who, when I see they're going to be at a show, it makes me want to go to that show more than I otherwise would. <laughs> like, like I see her on the dealer list or I mm-hmm. see that she's giving a talk or something. And I'm like, I'm there. Yeah. I got to see Trish. She mm-hmm. is um, just one of the nicest, most generous with her, her knowledge and her time um, uh, people in, in the hobby. And I am really, really excited to talk to her. Um, because she's just, I mean, again, her, her knowledge and, uh, you know, the things that she has handled in her career um, are amazing. Um, but she's just a, a really fun person to chat with as well. Mm-hmm. Um, she's one of these people who's very, un- like, you, you talk to her and you sort of forget that she's as prominent as she is because she's just so <laughs> disarmingly nice. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you remember what she's written and what she's researched. And it's like, you get nervous all of a sudden. Um, but, but this is really exciting i haven't seen her in a year um i want to say so this will be really great to um to catch up with trish let's bring her on hey there hi hey trish how you doing good I'm how are you that. i'm on the side <laughs> <laughs> so trish to kick things off michael and i were trying to figure out what we should discuss first and we figured we'd get the um uh, the elephant in the room uh, out of the way. It's been an eventful uh, week or two for the former Confederate Stamp Alliance, has it exactly. not? Exactly. It has. Only five, five and a half years in the making. <laughs> <laughs> can, can you talk a little bit about, um, for, for people who don't know, there was a, a vote held amongst the membership to change the name from the Confederate Stamp Alliance to the Civil War Stamp Society, is that correct? Civil War Philatelic Society. Philatelic Society, um, which, which you know, there, there were um, uh, there were arguments on both sides. This is something that came up a couple of years ago and was struck down, but um, th- this time was was a resounding victory, uh, I would say. Yes, it was eighty five percent, which uh, uh, kind of irked me when some people said the threshold was met. No, no, <laughs> the mandate. <laughs> It was not the threshold, in my opinion. I mean, it was, but you know what I'm saying. Any argument like this uh, in, in today's climate is obviously going to have a lot of other cultural stuff put on it. But I, I think, and this is you know, just me speaking, and, and maybe you can um, uh, give your thoughts as well. But to me, a change like this makes sense, not because of any other reason than um, it makes the society more inclusive. This is... Um, a hobby that's always looking for for new people and new ways to attract existing people um, in new directions. And I think that, um, you know, just by expanding the reach of the society, um, doubling the amount of area there is to cover now, just exactly. makes logistical sense. I don't think, again, it, it, of course, it's going to have other, uh, you know, external uh, uh, stuff put onto it. But but when you when you really just think about growing the society and, and keeping the society active, I really don't think that any of us were in a position to, you know, necessarily turn people away. If that, well, if that. The, the interesting thing on this was that uh, about six years ago, I started approaching people in the CSA who had a voice and trying to c- 
convince them that this should be a civil war group and not a Confederate group. And I got a resounding plus from everybody. Everybody thought it was a great idea. And the following year, a little guy named Dylan Roof came along and mowed down, you know, all the Bible study folks in Charleston. And um, then it was brought up and it was seen as reactionary when really that's not the way it started. Uh, but it became that way. And everybody said, no, 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 we're not going to do this. We don't want to be PC, you know. Uh, and I, <laughs> I get that to a point, but, and it will always, I, I sell Confederates. That's what I do. <laughs> but, but, but I don't but you, want that name out there. No, and, and you know better than anyone that it's impossible to, sell, to tell one side of the story without mm -hmm. acknowledging the other side. And I'm sure that if a great collection of Union patriotic covers, you know, walked up to you and and was there to be purchased, and you could make money on them. I'm sure you would be the first to you betcha to, to buy them. So, <laughs> so it, 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 it's I, I think that's interesting that it, that it started before there was so much um, discussion about statues, about flags, about things right. like that. Because again, to me, it just um, uh, you know H.R. Harmer was was uh, proud to support the name change because it just makes sense from a from a marketing standpoint to put it you know completely bluntly. And my favorite areas, frankly, have always been the across the lines material. And that is U.S. and Confederate. It's both. Uh, and how can you tell the history, as you say? How can you have one without the other? It's, it's imperative that you have both. But uh, I certainly am for uh, moving on. Um, and I think this is so important from so many standpoints. I'm sure a lot of people are wondering logistically what this means. The journal will be renamed. The society will be renamed. I'm sure the journal will have more content, uh, you know, yep. more diverse content in it. Um, how do you see this affecting the society in the next year, in in the really short term? What are the what are the what's the aftermath of this vote? Well, the 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 immediate aftermath will be there will be some folks who resign and mm. say la vie. You know that that's the way it is. Um, you know, what, what can you say? It's, uh, that's unfortunate. However, uh, there was one person in the meeting who uh, said he fully expected that we would swell to 1,200, 1,500 members, which is a wonderful <laughs> thought, uh, and I hope we do. How many uh, do you have there now? There certainly are. Michael? How many members are there now? There are about 550. Okay. Um, the most I've ever seen, and um, I've been a member a stunning 51 years, <laughs> so it's been a while. Um, the most I've ever seen was approaching 900, uh, and that's mm, maybe 40 years ago. Uh, it has been around 600 for a very long time, uh, and then it started dropping with all the uh, Dylan Roof mess and the last five years have been stressful. Um, there are those of us who really, really wanted to see the name change and others not so much. <laughs> Can you talk about your uh, your own career in Confederate postal history? Because I, you know, I, I love when we when we have a cover that you, you know, pass through your hands. Um, I, I'm, I'm thinking the three cent provisional in particular, you, you have a, yeah. a, one of the one of the deepest histories in this part of the hobby, can you tell us a little bit about your journey, how you got started, and uh, you know how you got to, to where you are today? Well, uh, if you count the itty bitty collection that I had, where I pasted stamps in a scrapbook, not an album. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully not Confederate provisionals. No, <laughs> I I didn't know what stamp collecting was. Never heard of philately. My parents were not collectors of anything, nor uh, did they do anything else that I tend to do. Um, it, we just weren't alike that way. Uh, but the collecting gene must be in there somewhere. Uh, so I started a kid collection because I was an army brat. And uh, the kid collection was uh, simply the male. You know, it was Kilaware. <laughs> you know? And uh, that, that happens and that's okay. Uh, but then when I was 17, someone introduced me to Confederate postal history, not even stamps, but postal history. And that did it. 
and I've never gotten out of it. And I am no longer 17. <laughs> Did you have an interest in the Civil War before that? What was your exposure historically? You know, what, what, what was it about the you know, Confederate puzzle history that jumped out? Or was, was it just... Uh, Everything. I, I just love the uses. Um, it, things like wallpaper covers. Uh, so much happened in the war. Uh, it has all the facets of U.S. postal history but it also has so much more um there's you can collect everything you collect in u.s postal history and and then some so you have things uh, some of the favorite areas are adversity covers uh adversity covers uh, wallpaper covers are the most popular of adversity covers and why do they call it adversity covers because of the adverse conditions the war caused, uh, making it so the Confederacy could not get paper supplies and could not get envelopes, could not get writing paper. So they took book leaves out of books. They took, they did not take wallpaper off the walls. They took spare rolls of, of wallpaper. Uh, but there are many sorts of things like that uh, that are extremely attractive and the price is not driven really by philately, it's driven by aesthetics. So if it's really cool looking, then, you know, it sells for a lot. And if the flashier the wallpaper, uh, the more popular, and which means more money. Uh, but it's, it's all in the eyes of the beholder. Some people love the more garish, the geometrics, which are really weird. You think of Victorian, you don't think of squares and circles and rectangles and triangles, but they had all that. And I can't imagine they stuck it on the wall, but they did. <laughs> and, uh, I'm, I'm more of a floral person myself. I could live without the geometrics, but there are those who only like those. So uh, it's all in the eyes of the beholder. And um, you well know at auction, uh, yeah, Katie bar the door. I mean, I've seen them go for many thousands of dollars and by rights, it should be a $150 cover. It is not. Wow. Um, and I remember telling Scott Catalog when it was listed uh, about $150 that uh, that was so far off and at that time, uh, it was jacked up to uh, $800, and I'm talking for a common stamp. Uh, if you put a not common stamp on it, obviously it goes up exponentially. So a lot of fun, and um, I just never got out of it. So, you know, age 17, I was introduced to it, um, and then I jumped into organized philately in 1969, which is when I joined both APS and CSA, and those have been my go-to societies forevermore. Um, and of course, no longer CSA, it's the CWPS, and I'm going to have a hard time with that, but <laughs> <laughs> trying to remember it, changing all my ads. <laughs> so what made you decide to go from a collector to a dealer of your caliber? Uh, it's really simple, a paycheck. <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, just uh, earning money at that time. I was in my early 20s and I became the Jane of all trades. So I began writing auction lots. I began typing things. I began uh, prices realized because we typed them. Not something I remember fondly. <laughs> <laughs> it was a while before we got computers. <laughs> uh, it was the old-fashioned way. The bid books were uh, handwritten, uh, long strings of bids with uh, numbers for bidders. Um, and basically, it was a learn-on-the-go situation. And that was true for John, too. Uh, and he kind of came around the same way I did, except he had a father who uh, was a collector and pushing him, and a brother who was a collector. Um, but I had no guiding light. My guiding light became John. Um, so that was kind of cool. And we kind of stumbled around together and figured it out and, um, made an auction house. 
Wow. From c- collecting kilowatt to, to what it is now. That's, it, it, it's that's really a, a baptism journey. by fire to go from uh, <laughs> Tell to go me from about no- it. To go from nothing to one of the most complex, difficult areas, I think is amazing. Yeah. You know, most people have a more gradual progression and you really just went from zero to sixty. <laughs> <laughs> that truly did, and uh, unexpectedly in so many directions. I told you I joined the CSA and the APS in 69. In 1970, one year later, I was editor of the Confederate Philatelist. So, <laughs> and did I know a whole lot? No, I really didn't, but uh, my English skills were pretty good, and my organizational skills were pretty good, and um, I became... Um, you know, so engrossed in it, and the auction house was not strictly Confederates uh, or even Civil War. It was everything. Uh, we sold uh, six C3As over the years. Uh, the first one of the recovered McCoy uh, stolen oh, wow. Jennies was uh, sold on behalf of APRL, and I don't even remember the year, but. A long time ago, Jim DeVos was the uh, executive director at that time. Uh, so it was a, a real journey and a lot of fun. Uh, I enjoyed the auction business. I'm really glad to not be in the auction business right now <laughs> because sitting around in my jeans and in a t-shirt is far more fun. <laughs> it's, since you joined the, the CWPS, you're right. <laughs> I know we're struggling with that. <laughs> I, I, we still have a grace period where we're gonna we're gonna mess it up. But how have you noticed um, collecting habits change? Because um, I, I, from from what I've read or gathered, at least, I would say that um, uh, in terms of U.S. philately, postal history has become more important over the years. But at, at least from reading the classic works of Confederate literature. Um, there's always been a heavy emphasis on postal history in the yes. Confederate world. So w- within uh, Confederate philately, um, what have been the biggest shifts in collecting interest or buying interest, would you say, in the last five decades? I'd say postal history has been a primary focus all along. Uh, and indeed, I started with postal history, which you would think would be the pinnacle and not the beginning. Uh, I had to go learn the stamps because they were on the covers. <laughs> <laughs> so it was all backwards. Uh, but I enjoyed it. Um, and it's been fun. There are still not that many articles uh, in what will be the Civil War philatelist. Um, it, I write uh, a number of them. Um, that are fly spec philately. Um, and that's pretty much the only place I put them because my writing and I write for five different journals, uh, wow. the rest of them are more general. Uh, La Posta and the ASDA magazine, uh, American Philatelist, these are all more general sorts of things. So my specialist stamp material goes directly into the specialist uh, publication, which is for the Civil War Philatelic Society now. Uh, but I do a lot of uh, new things. Uh, um, Charles mentioned the three centers. Uh, that certainly was one of the huge feathers in my cap. I was going to uh, ask if time. you had a uh, discovery or uh, something, you know, something you're most proud of uh, bringing to the, the wider philatelic world in your career. Is it the three centers? It has to be uh, because everybody thought I was nuts. Um, <laughs> can, I mean, can you, do, do you mind telling that story about what, you know, what these three centers are that were? alluding to? It's the three cent Madison Courthouse Postmaster Provisionals. uh, And what makes them so incredibly special, um, there are many things, but they're special because they are three cents, which was the US rate. The first one that was discovered was actually discovered by John Walter Scott, as in Scott Catalog, Scott Publishing. Um, And that was in 1862, uh, 1872, pardon me. 1872, and uh, he at that time, and I'm paraphrasing here, said it was the best authenticated, uh, rarest, um, you know, best of provisionals. And indeed, it was the first ever 
of the Confederate era provisionals. But when they walked into our office, and when I say they walked into our office, five of these walked in, one on cover and uh, four off cover. Now, one on cover, one five center, which is the Confederate rate, three cents, of course, was the US rate, um, and then three of the three cent stamps, uh, not on cover, because there's only one cover. And they were tainted because Scott, of course, found them. He put them in the Scott catalog. And then by the turn of the century, they disappeared. They were no longer in the catalog. Um, and I did track down the dates uh, with old catalogs. I, I don't remember exactly when they disappeared, but in the 1800s. Uh, and then a number of people like Ashbrook, uh, they were against it. They thought they were all fakes. Uh, so it kind of became, at that point, uh, a real journey for me to try and prove them genuine. Uh, that took over 16 years, and it took trips to Madison, Florida. Uh, we met at the time John was still alive. We met with uh, the great, 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 I forget how many greats, grandson of the postmaster who created them, and together, he, his wife was a genealogist. And uh, of course, I was a postal historian. And uh, being in the DC area, was in the National Archives and the Library of Congress all the time. It was a subway ride. It was easy. Uh, today, it's easier yet. <laughs> I just go online <laughs> and find the, the same material without uh, going through it. Uh, one of the interesting things is when I was pawing through uh, the Library of Congress and found the um, postmaster's letter, which was written to the New York Times saying, I'm not a crook. I'm not doing all these things wrong that you're accusing me of. Uh, this was an innocent thing. I wasn't trying to make postage stamps. They were just receipts. Um, so he was backpedaling big time and there were all kinds of documents in the archives that were from the postmaster general chastising Samuel Perry, who, which was, who was the postmaster, and telling him that that was, uh, you know, a no-no and he shouldn't be doing that. But mind you, this was in January and February. The CSA didn't even exist. It was a seceded state. So it was a few days after the state of Florida seceded is when Perry created those stamps. Why? By his own admission, and it, I you know, found a, a handwritten letter that said, I did this because I didn't want to send Washington, D.C. any money. I, I wanted to make my own. Um, so he did. And one of the things I found most interesting was he talked about a one cent stamp. We've never found a one cent stamp. So somewhere out there, there's another, there's a one cent Madison somewhere. But, you know, uh, and it was in the archives because he said attached is my three cent and my one cent stamp. Here's a copy. Well, who knows? Maybe it'll show up someday. If it does, it'll probably be you know, passed down from whatever thief took it, <laughs> you know, out of the archives. Uh, so it, it, it was an interesting journey and it, it, uh, start, it started out with the PF. Uh, the CSA refused to authenticate it because it wasn't Confederate. It and was Florida. I had a point there, but it wasn't Confederate. It wasn't U.S. What was it? So this this was part of the discussion in the office. I mean, we had a lot of you know auction describers sitting around going, "What is this thing anyway?" Uh, and um, eventually we came to it. I speaking with Jim Kletzel, who I still work with today on Scott Catalog. In fact, I owe him Volume One prices today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he and I kind of came up together with the 3 cent 1861 postmasters provisionals. So that doesn't say US and it doesn't say 
Confederate, but it is placed right in front of the catalog. But once the Madisons came along and they finally got authenticated with the PF, uh, which took some <laughs> doing, um, we started looking for others. And of all things, a week after the Madisons walked in the door, uh, the Hillsboro, North Carolina, three cent walked in the door and um, I just never, I couldn't imagine. I, it, it had no denomination. It's just a simple piece of paper with a paid on it. So there is, but it was a May 27th date, which was uh, North Carolina. That was the day it uh, either joined the Confederacy or seceded, I can't remember, joined the Confederacy, I believe. Um, and I was never so excited. We sold that privately. Uh, never so excited to see it again when it appeared in 2016 in New York. It's and I had <laughs> no idea where it was, but you did. <laughs> I was shocked when I saw it uh, in the frames because, of course, it was in the air of Van Haub uh, material that Harmers is, is handling so well um uh, really lovely catalogs thank you I, I think that's such a fun story though this three cent rate that is the you know the holdover from the the u.s uh, you know they, they'd all been u.s post offices for so right. long um you know i i think that that fact that there's this transitional period where really no one knows what to do the csa hasn't established a rate yet and they're still kind of you know used to being you i i think that idea that there's this uh, bizarre short-lived three cent rate is just one of the greatest um, uh, stories in philately. I think that's yeah. that's yeah. really an incredible uh, and, and the fact that any of these things survived the fact that they were only used in such a short window it would have been easy for that to have gone completely unnoticed and uh, some of them are are hand stamp provisionals the ones uh, because the three cent rate was used up until June 1st when the Confederate Post Office took over finally so we have all the way from January and February to June 1st. And that was, a, so there's still a wealth of possibilities out there of more three cent stamps coming up. Uh, one of the first things I did was look through the Scott catalog and had remembered that there was a three cent Tuscumbia tore my hair out, could not figure out where it was. I thought it was in Caspery looked in the Casper Confederate catalog, it wasn't there. Why? Because it was in the U.S. catalog. <laughs> you know? And uh, once I determined that, um, I realized that was all wrong, that the Tuscumbia was not a U.S. as it had been for years. It was at that time and still is, I think, hanging in around 15,000 of catalog value. Um, but that's a hand stamp provisional, and for years it was considered a U.S. provisional, listed in the U.S. provisional section as 1857-58 uh, era, which made zero sense. I think even Luff in his book puts it with the... That's right. Exactly. And Luff was one of the naysayers for the Madisons as well. Uh, I, in, in print, he basically said, ah, this is a label, it's nothing... Um, you know, others were more bold and just said it's a fake. Uh, and there are fakes out there, but they're really bad fakes. They don't look <laughs> anything like the real thing. Uh, one of the really neat things that they did, uh, Postmaster Perry's son was editor of um, the local newspaper. They printed the stamps at the local newspaper office. And while the ink was wet, they blew bronze dust on the wet ink and it became golden looking. So the early publications called it the golden stamp of Madison. And indeed, if you look carefully at it, it's hard to photograph to advantage, but if you see the real thing, you'll see it's clearly glittery. It's, hmm. it's gold um, it, it's, and black underneath. Oh, it's a neat item, and uh, that's only one of the many things, but it's probably the best known uh, thing that I've done. But there have been other exciting ones, too. I have uh, another exciting one coming up 
that'll be published um, this coming year, um, and that's the J.B. Dutton correspondence. Uh, there are about 16 of those covers, and it's a straight line hand stamp, J.B. Dutton, uh, and you say, well, who's he? And this is the perfect example of why we should have the CWPS and not the CSA, because Dutton was a pacifist Quaker from Waterford, Virginia, and he basically was chased across the river to Maryland. The whole area there is all backwards. Waterford, Virginia was mostly Quakers, and that whole area, which Virginia, of course, seceded and became part of the Confederacy, but not Waterford. Um, and so on the other side of the river, we have Maryland with Southern leanings, that little tiny section of Virginia with Union leanings, it's a backwards scenario. And Dutton went across the river because he couldn't stay in Waterford. He left his wife and the kids uh, and all the relatives and friends in Waterford while he went to Point of Rocks across the river, Potomac, and uh, ran the local store there out of which he um, handled the mail. He had a son-in-law and a nephew who were the respective postmasters in both of those two towns. The mail, say from the north, which the majority is all but one cover, the mail was addressed to, um, to Point of Rocks, Maryland. But the destination was Waterford and beyond. Wow. Hmm. And it was hand stamped by Dunn because he knew where it was going. He knew the families. So that's another kind of thing. interesting. And that'll be published yeah, next year. That'll be published next year by La Posta Publications. Wow. Uh, it'll be uh, one of their monographs. It'll be the third of their monographs. I did the first one as well. But there are other things like that as well. That's just those are the kinds of things I really enjoy. The heavy duty research. That was another one of those things where people told me they had you're all wet that that doesn't mean anything Dutton hand stamps nothing uh, but, but it's an across the lines uh, yep and I, I found all the information in the uh, Southern Claims Commission uh, in the National Archives uh, just tons of uh, research on that then and I live for the research I love the research so it, bringing it back just a second, because I, I found this so fascinating, say hypothetically one of these one cent rates are found, how, just one of them, how would you or, or uh, everyone else involved go about evaluating the, the price of it? Say it was guaranteed genuine, everybody said, agreed, yes, this is, this is the one cent that, that was referred back to, it, how, would, how would the price or value or catalog value be determined? Two people at auction. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it really is that simple because you could put a price on it. I could put a price on it. What we yeah. say doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been so wrong in both directions. Uh, you you just don't know until you take it to auction. You really just do not know, uh, and it takes two. Yeah. Uh, you know. <laughs> The bidder and the underbidder, and uh, there are oh so many people who uh, get carried away, and mm -hmm. auctioneers love that. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, we're talking about auctions now, and I think there is this impression that um, a lot of Confederate philately is expensive, and I'd imagine that's a, a there's, a, a, there's probably, I, I would say there's a perception that there's a high barrier of entry. Is there a way for somebody who maybe doesn't have vast resources, maybe doesn't have the knowledge to to get their foot in the door with Confederate philately? Is there a way? I, again, I, I would I would love to own the the Grove Hill or the Livingston Pair or these great icons of philately, but uh, I mean that's out of reach for for most all of us. What what can I do as a a, a novice? Um, again, maybe with not a huge budget, how can I get involved in Confederate philately? I'd say to two things uh one the stamps most of the stamps are actually pretty cheap uh the more expensive ones are still not out of reach 
Uh, it's when you start putting them on covers <laughs> that they tend to get more expensive. But there are lots of stampless covers. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as the stamps themselves, there are stamps that the 11s and 12s, uh, the common issues, they catalog $20 or less. They're cheap. I, I mean, I think that's cheap. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know? um, and you can uh, get heavily into the stamps with shades because the inks were mixed daily. Uh, so while Scott Catalog says blue, milky blue, greenish blue, th that's about all. In fact, there must be 50 in interim shades and they just go exponentially. As far as the postal history, which most of us fall in love with, uh, there is so much. Stefan Jaronski uh, made a fabulous collection, uh, which has won awards uh, over the years by his heavy research in the soldier field. So soldiers covers are really relatively inexpensive. When I say inexpensive, uh, anywhere from say 50 to $150 is a common soldiers cover. Uh, that's not a ton of money, uh, you know, and by collector standards. Hmm. Uh, the other one is stampless covers. Uh, pick a town, any town. Richmond is very common because it was the capital. It was big. Uh, Peter Powell wrote an entire book on nothing but the cancellations of Richmond, Virginia. That's how much info there is out there. So the information is out there. One of the great things about Confederate philately and postal history has been uh, the number of people who research it and write about it. Uh, there are a huge number of fabulous publications out there for the easily found, you know, go to the APRL, uh, you know, the libraries, they're now more and more, they're digitizing. So uh, the complete run of the Confederate Flatalist is online um, and will continue to be put online. Um, and of course, the new publication, uh, the Civil War Philatelist in January. So uh, I know at least two people who held back and did not put articles where they wanted to. Uh, one of them I begged not to take his article anywhere else and to hold it on the hopes that the CSA would change to CWPS, and they did. So Dan Knowles is the person I'm talking about, uh, who's a well-known collector of both sides, and North and South, and he has an article that's coming out in the first quarter on the Pioneer Express which is both, it ran in both the South and the North. So perfect. Uh, this is a perfect example of how fascinating this area is going to be. Uh, and that uh, magazine has always been an award winner and I think it'll get better and better. Kind of uh, piggybacking on, on Charles's question, what, you, what literature would you recommend for beginners looking to get into uh, Confederate collecting? Or civil well, the, the number one would be, well, number one, join CWPS because you'll get a quarterly journal, which is quality and has everything. But as far as actual uh, existing publications, uh, one's going to be the Scott catalog. The other is going to be the <laughs> Confederate States of America catalog of stamps and postal history. Nice Which is one of the most gorgeous catalogs for any collecting field. That is a, a joy to behold, that book. Thank you. I, I kind of uh, couldn't help it. Uh, the uh, Dietz is the, August Dietz was the beginner of the Confederate Stamp Alliance and uh, well known way before that began in 1935. Uh, and 1929, he produced the Confederate Postal History book, which we just refer to as the 29 Deets. That had three editions. One was gray leather, the deluxe. One was just standard gray cloth. And the in-between book 
was the library edition, and it is that's what I mimicked when I picked that binding. I love that binding. I always love that binding, um, except that it fell apart. They used inferior leather, and um, it it was just a terrible looking thing. If you see a gorgeous one, it means it's rebound. <laughs> <laughs> so that's uh, to answer Michael's question. Uh, the twenty nine deets is is very important. Uh, there was a reprint as well that was done by Ken Lawrence, um, forget the year, in the 90s sometimes. Um, so there's four different possibilities of editions. That's important, although there's now a lot of material that's not only dated but been proven incorrect because uh, that happens. <laughs> Uh, but the CSA catalog, uh, the one I edited in 2012, that's the Bible. And, and, and my last question for you, Trish, you talk about the Deeds catalog in 1929. That's nearly um, uh, a century of serious study of Confederate philately, not even talking about you know going back further than that when there were actually people running around the South trying to find new stamp issues and such. Right. Do you feel like there's still a lot of research to be done? Do you think there's still a lot of, you know, in, in a lot of fields in this hobby and in other hobbies, I, I think there's sort of the, uh, impression that that everything's been done and you know you read articles in the chronicle in the 70s and 80s and it seems like they solved all the world's problems back then and what is there left for us to do do you think that uh confederate philately is particularly ripe for new discoveries and and do you think there's still things out there that would surprise you you've seen everything there is to see um, are there still still things that will shock you when they absolutely. come out? Absolutely. Uh, along the lines of Dutton, uh, I covert mail is one of my absolute favorite areas, and uh, just published. And the first half and the second half about to be uh, is on Jenkins Express. Two covers, not very pretty, just manuscript covers, but they have something exciting for postal historians, and that's Jenkins. Express, 25 cents. Wow. And this kind of dropped in my lap, uh, not from a postal history source, but from a document source, a manuscript dealers. Um, he knew enough to call me and say, is this Express thing, in, shouldn't that be worth something? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I've actually sat on that for about a decade. Uh, waiting to do the research, um, and I finally did. I still have no clue who Jenkins was. I have a good idea, uh, but it's a guess. I can only guess that it's the guy I think it is. Um, so it was a very interesting research, uh, a lot of fantastic original um, letters in it, but, and the most important thing about the letters is they said, and it was from a soldier uh, in a Virginia regiment who was sending letters home to his wife and they were being smuggled through the lines by quote unquote, this man Jenkins who charges me 25 cents and I pay him 50 cents so that he'll bring me one back from you. So every time I see him, I give him 50 cents. So he, it's a return. Uh, and that was only the first couple of years. It was 62 and 63. Uh, and how do I know this? Because again, we have the letters and the letters by this man, uh, Bazzi, uh, say, I'm sorry, we can't, we don't have that source anymore. I have to send it by mail. Uh, I don't like sending it by mail, but uh, we can't get across the river anymore. It's too dangerous. It can't be done. That was in 64. So no 64, no 65. It was all in 62 and 63. That's incredible. So wow. that's, that's just one example of the types of things that come up. Uh, found uh, another item just presented itself, literally fell out of a book. I mean, it's the old cliche. <laughs> we want things to fall out of books that look like this. It was a patriotic sticker, uh, the kind that were slapped on uh, envelopes. Not They didn't do duty as postage, but they are very collectible as 
patriotic stickers uh, on patriotic covers. And they're patriotic covers only because of the sticker. Uh, we usually cannot prove them, however, because they mostly were not postmarked. Why would they be? They weren't postage. But it was the largest known uh, partial sheet. It was, I think, three shy of a full sheet. Wow. So that was kind of cool. Um, and, uh, you know, things like that. So things continue to happen. Uh, I continually look at the stamps, too. Uh, there are imprints on them, uh, and I've been able to disprove some of Dietz's assertions over the years uh, by later research. And that's one thing I always warn researchers is don't assume because it was so, and Dietz said it in 1929, that it is still so. Hmm. You know, you always need to continue your research. <clears throat> Wow. Well, it, this has been fantastic, Trish. I, I yeah. miss seeing you at shows. I mean, it's, it's been great to catch up like this. Again, it, yeah. it's, um, you know, it's a, a small consolation, um, you know, versus seeing everybody face to face. But it's been really great to catch up and uh, and, and to hear a bit about your story. And the research you're doing is amazing. Yeah. Well, sounds... thank you for having me. Yeah. Th thank I've you so much it. for joining us. It, it sounds like you're, you're this is incredible work being done almost behind the scenes for all of our gain. I was going to say, so many aspects of the hobby just seem uh, yeah. stale or musty or whatever, and the, the the Confederate world just always seems to turn out new and exciting things, which yeah. is which is fun to follow. Well, the it, writing is so much a part of it. I I consider myself so fortunate to be a dealer, uh, and and actually no longer an auctioneer, but someone who handles things on a daily basis that I can spend my time. I don't have to worry about a deadline. Mm -hmm. Well, I do worry about a deadline, but it's a, a publishing deadline of a different <laughs> sort. Um, don't have to worry about consigners. How about that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, uh, it's fun to research the material and that's how you learn. Yeah. Um, yeah, you do find new things because of that. And the more you know, the more you know. Well, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for, for taking pleasure. your time out to do this. I thought that was a really great conversation. I, um, I, I the stories she tells about yeah. about the Jenkins Express or about the across the lines, uh, you know, the guy smuggling mail uh, from Maryland into Virginia. I think right. these, these remind us why we do this. I mean, yeah, it's great to um, you know sell things that are well known or well established, but when you realize how much more out there there is to learn, mm -hmm. I think that's what. So it keeps us all going. Well, discoveries like these can also, you know, almost change history books. They almost change the, the... Absolutely. You know, which is just wild to think of philatelists out there just enjoying their hobby, changing U.S. history. Changing the way we look at the Civil War, like, the, right. you know, the most monumental event in our nation's history. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, there's these covers out there that land in Trisha's lap that tell entirely new chapters yeah documentaries could be uh written on them absolutely and it may be even produced yes yeah of yeah, course. yeah yeah and, uh, you, you know you write the screenplay and then get yeah to no it. i get i get it yeah <laughs> Maybe you're on the same page here no yeah um, I, it's yeah no I, I i i thought that was a really great chat um we have something to talk about as well coming up we're actually doing a aps stamp chat Q and A. It's not. We're not presenting anything, but we're talking. We have about... nothing going into this. We have no <laughs> script. This is right. this is um you know completely off the cuff. We don't know right. what we're going to be talking about because mm -hmm. we don't know what we're going to be asked. We haven't anything. placed people in the audience. Uh, we haven't got people asking questions that I may I may plan to some people. questions with Olivia. Okay. Um, some softball so that we get off on a, a good yeah. good note. But um, what's your middle name? Stuff like that. What's a stamp? Yes, um, it's a good one. You know, things that we, we even even you and I can answer. I think would be would be good. <laughs> yeah, uh, but it, it's mostly going to be on Charles. You'll be talking about the auction house experience, and, I'll and be you'll talking be talking about, about the eBay experience. Yeah, which are really just two levels of the same experience. I would say pretty so much. It's it, it, you know it, it's uh, sort of a stratified market. I would say, and mm -hmm. it'll be good for us to you know. Because there's a lot of people who have stuff that could go your way or my way, and I think it'll mm -hmm. be good to 
dispel some myths and answer some questions and yeah. uh, clarify some some things that maybe people don't know about. I think it'll be a really good opportunity for yeah. us to um, like. Do you get to keep the paddle? Some people do. Some people don't. Yeah. Um, <laughs> depends on they, how much you spend. It, it depend, depends on whether they <laughs> want to keep them or not. Uh, we have a couple numbers missing because people just took them home. Mm-hmm. Um, but yes, that's a very good question, Michael. We'll, we'll yeah. save the, the full answer for uh, Wednesday. Wednesday the 16th at what time? 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Is that minus 5 it GMT? Is. It is minus 5 GMT. <laughs> well, uh, 6.30 p.m. Eastern, December 16th, APS. They're going to be like, it's 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 going to be a Zoom call. So that I I think they're posting it to Facebook Live. They're doing YouTube Live, um, and they're doing a, a whole bunch of other things where people can register. By the and, time this interview runs, we will have a link that we can share down below. Yeah, we should. We'll put the link in bio as we love to do. That's our that's our motto. I think we're yeah. the first ones to come up with that phrase. So mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. so that'll be fun. I'm looking forward to that. Um, this is fun. Uh, yeah. If you're listening. Google Podcast, Spotify Podcast, Apple Podcast, Podbean. Apple, yeah. I said Apple. Sorry. Uh, Podbean. Um, <laughs> flatterlypodcast.com, flatterlypodcast at gmail.com to send us your emails. We've been getting some good recommendations for people to appear, which has yeah. been fun. I've even gotten a couple of phone calls about people who listen. Yeah. Um, shows you how hard I am to track down. Uh, right. Well, I, you got your Twitter now, so it's easier to on find. On Twitter? Um, yeah. I think my only tweets in the last month have been retweeting you. That's fine. That's fine. And then if somebody retweets you, I retweet them. <laughs> um, and, that, and then I get a notification every time somebody likes one of your tweets that I mentioned in. So it drives me crazy. Because yeah, I, that's the point. I try that's... and have no um, notification, like the little red numbers on my lock on yeah. my home screen. Mm-hmm. I have none of those. And I'm like, what's that? And it's because somebody liked a tweet I was mentioned in. So mm-hmm. um, I don't really think I grasp the concept of twitter yeah if i don't want to be bothered by notifications i probably shouldn't have a twitter no you should absolutely not <laughs> i should avoid twitter like the plague yeah. um but we are on twitter i'm i'm we'll put it in the bio we'll put it in the bio if you follow michael i'll be retweeting all of his <laughs> stuff i don't remember my handle i think it's charles lepting hmm because i think i used to have an old account that was just charles epting so i had to add my middle initial but i could be wrong I give, don't Charles Lep- I don't, I don't give, give Charles Lepting a follow. See if it's me. Yeah, see if it's me. It'll be uh, uh it'll be exciting. I, you know what? I'm gonna do that. Even if it's not you, I'm gonna follow that guy. Some random guy. Yeah. Uh, being bombarded with your retweets. Uh, so, <laughs> anyways, on that note, Michael, this was a lot. <laughs> All right, great. This has been a lot of fun, Michael. We'll talk yeah. real soon. All right. See you then. All right. But see you in uh, two days when this airs. Yes. Um, I'll see you on the 16th, which is two days from now. (laughs) True. Whoa. That's that's called production value. Okay. All right. Well, I'll see you then, Michael. Bye.